So thank you everyone uh, again for joining us today in this uh, fourth installment of the R workshop series. Uh, so today we'll mostly talk about data visualization with ggplot, but I will also try to catch us up um, with some things that we left unfinished last week. Um, so a little bit about what we did last week. So we talked about data wrangling with dplyr and tidyr. Uh, so we learned how to subset columns uh, or rows using the select or filter functions uh, respectively. And we also learned how to create new columns from data we already had in our data set using mutate. We also learned about pipes, which let us uh, join or link the output of one function to the input of another function. And we also very briefly spoke a little bit about um, joins, which allow us to combine uh, two or more data sets together. We didn't have time to uh, reshape data frames uh, or export data frames. So I will actually uh, show you how to do that now before we move on. So as always, uh, to get started, please navigate to your um, folder on your computer where you have saved the project for this uh, workshop and click on the um, our project file um, that we created to open our studio. Um, and this still has open uh, my um, script from last week. So I'm just going to close that and open a new script and I will save it immediately into my scripts folder. I will call it data visualization dot r. Okay, so always at the beginning of our script, we want to have um, the, yeah, we want to load the packages that we will use um, in that script. So we will definitely be using the tidyverse package and we will also be using the um, Lubridate package a little bit um, to help us um, work with dates. So we've loaded our packages, that's great. Um, the next thing we need is to get um, our data into R. And one thing that I should mention is that uh, when I asked you to download uh, the dates file last week, uh, those dates file um, had a couple of mistakes. So uh, it would be great if you could download um, that file again. I have corrected the mistakes and re-uploaded it. So um, in the HackMD, there is this um, code, uh, which you can copy and paste directly into your RStudio. Uh, for ease, I will, I will also put it in the chat. So if you just, um, yeah, paste that in your script and just run it, um, that should just work but I will wait for a moment in case uh, something goes wrong. Um, if something about this is not working, uh, please put up a, a red X and um, either Rania or Ellen uh, will be able to help you. But if um, everyone's managing okay with this, I will just um, move on. So I'll pick up a bit from you know where we left off last week. So we have two data sets that we joined together. The first data set was um, our data about COVID cases. Uh, both of the data sets that we have are saved in, so this is my directory with all of my files. Um, and these two data sets are in my data raw folder. So I want to start by reading those two in. So COVID data, 
So our function for reading in CSV files is the read underscore CSV uh, function. And we need to pass the path and the name of our file, which is COVID data. Oops, I forgot to add the folder, um, which is data raw and COVID data get CSV. So if I run this, uh, my COVID data appears there. And then I want to also read in um, my dates um, data. And if you don't remember what these data sets are about, don't worry, I will um, remind you in a moment. So this dates uh, file is a TSV file, a tab separated values file. So uh, I can't use my read CSV function, but thankfully there is a very similar function, function called read TSV, um, and then we do the same thing again. Uh, we type the file, <laughs> the file path. Okay, I'm doing well with typing today. Hopefully, um, I'll warm up and stop making this many typos. Uh, okay, uh, data raw, and then dates TSV, and we read that in, and now we have both of our data. Uh, both of our data sets in our environment. Um, so in case uh, you don't remember what these are about. So if we look at our COVID data, um, we see that the time information we have about this is this year uh, week column, which tells us, you know, in 2020, uh, you know, this observation came from the first week of 2020. This came from the first um, I've shorted, sorted them weirdly, but, um, you know, it tells us which week and which year, which is a little bit difficult for, um, I think, most people to just, like, look at and understand which date this is. So I also added a, oops, not this, I also added a file um, which tells us when this week, the first week of 2020 started and when it ended. Um, and what we want to do is um, merge these uh, data sets together so that this information exists in this data set as well. So the function that we used uh, to do this last time is uh, a function called inner join. Um, and the way this works is uh, we give it um, at least at least two arguments, um, which are the two data sets that we want to join together. So in this case, COVID data and dates. And although this is technically optional because R can figure out what makes sense, I think it's always a good idea to explicitly specify which variable you're using to join these data together. In our case, this variable is the year week variable. So if you um, look at the year week here, uh, it is spelled year underscore week. And here as well, it is year underscore week. And they are structured in exactly the same way. So it's like year hash uh, dash um, and the week number, and the same thing here, year, dash, and the week number. On top of that, um, both of these data sets contain information about exactly the same weeks. So they both start on the first week of 2020, and they both end on the 24th week of 2022. So these are basically identical between these two data sets. And I can use this uh, variable, this column, to tell R, okay, when you see the value, you know, 2022-24 in this data set, you can take the values for 2022-24 from this data set and smush them together. So I'm just going to do that now, uh, and I'm going to assign this into a new um, data set that I'm going to call COVID data dates. And if I run this now and look at my data set, we'll see that that is exactly what has happened. 
So we now have two more columns, the from date and to date columns that came from the dates data set. Um, there are more join functions. It's not just the inner join. Um, I think I should be able to pull this up here. So yeah, as you can see, there are more functions um, where use the inner join, very commonly used is also the left join, right join and full join. Um, I won't have time to walk you through um, the distinctions for all of these, but in the resources, I have linked to a blog post that explains when you would, when you would use um, each of them. For our purposes, all of these would do the same thing because the number of weeks that we have in each of our data sets is exactly the same. These would come in handy if, say, for COVID data, uh, for the COVID data data set, we had information from the first week of 2020 until the 24th week of 2022. But in the dates one, we had, you know, information from the first week of 2020 until this current week or like last week. So not the 24th week of 2022, but I don't know, like the 40th something week. And then it would make a difference which one of these functions we use. So that's a little bit about joins. I wanted to clarify that a little because last week I kind of just threw it at you um, <laughs> and um, uh, moved on. And it is um, a very useful uh, function to, to understand. So hopefully that clarifies things. Um, if there are any questions about this, please do uh, post it in the HackMD or in the chat. Um, and I will wait for a moment to see if there are any questions. But I think that is fine. So I will move on. Um, OK, so this is what we did last week. Uh, the thing that I wanted to show you today is something called pivoting. So if we look at our um, COVID data, um, we have one um, column here called indicator that contains information about the cases uh, and the deaths uh, in each of these countries. And we get information about the weekly count um, for the cases and for the deaths uh, in this different column. This is fine, um, but I personally would prefer to have um, a column called cases and a column called deaths, the values of which would be, you know, how many cases there were that week or how many deaths there were that week. So I want to quite drastically reshape my, um, my data set. Um, which sounds difficult, but R actually has some really, really handy functions to help you do that. So one of them is called pivot longer, and one of them is called pivot wider. And these functions exist to help you transform your data into like tidier data sets. Uh, if you remember a couple of workshops ago, we talked about tidy data having their um, variables as columns and their observations as rows, and each cell containing only one value. So reshaping data in a longer or wider format uh, is usually to help you um, abide by those principles of the tidy data. Uh, and if you're curious about tidy data, again, I've linked uh, more resources in the HackMD, so do have a look um, if you'd like to refresh your memory or learn more about uh, tidy data. Um, so I will show you how to do this um, in a slightly shorter data set. I'll, I'll use just the data for like the UK just to make it a little bit easier to see. So uh, first I'm going to create a new data set for the UK data, uh, COVID data, uh, and I'm gonna pipe it uh, into a function to help me filter only the data that comes from the United Kingdom. 
and then I will select only a few country, uh, only a few variables, uh, just to make it easier to look at. So I'm going to get my country um, indicator, um, weekly count, and year week. Okay, so let's look at this data set now. All right, so this is a lot easier to look at. Uh, so what I am going to do is I am going to basically transform these two variables. So instead of having this indicator and weekly count, I'm going to have a column about cases and a column about deaths. Um, okay, so COVID UK. Um, and the function I will use is called pivot wider. And there are two really important arguments that we need um, in the pivot wider function. So one of them is where the names of the columns are coming from. So one of them is called names from, and the other is called values from. So this is asking me, okay, you're going to create some new columns, where do you want the names of those columns to come from? And this is asking, where do you want the values um, that are going to fill up those columns? Where are those going to come from? So in my case, uh, the names will come from the indicator column because I want you know, two variables called cases and deaths. So here I'm going to write indicator and in my values, I'm going to write weekly count because that is that is what I want. Okay, so now I'm going to run this and I will pipe it into a view function just so we can look at it. Okay, so this is what I have now created. So as you can see, so this is what I had before. Country, indicator, weekly count, year, week. And this is what I have now. Country, year, week, cases, and deaths. And as you can see, I no longer have the indicator and weekly count uh, columns at all. They've completely been replaced uh, by these two columns over here, um, which contain the information about the weekly counts of cases and the weekly counts of deaths. Um, does that make sense? I find it, a, you know, a, a very big <laughs> transformation to to do on your data. And I'm honestly kind of shocked every time that R just does that so kind of like easily, it seems. Um, so do let me know if something about that was unclear or if you would like me to repeat anything. I don't see any questions. So if that was all clear, um, the next thing that we will do is we will just put together everything that we did last week uh, to create a clean data set. It's not fully clean, it's just like putting everything that we learned uh, together and because that's going to be quite a lot of lines of code, um, I'm not going to um, do it live. Uh, I have prepared it in advance, and I would recommend you also paste it, uh, copy paste it from uh, the HackMD. I will put it in the chat, uh, but I think it's more likely to work um, if you just copy it from HackMD. I think the chat may mess up some formatting or whatever. Okay, so these are things that we uh, saw how to do last week. So um, as you remember, I went on and on about how um, the countries, um, the country um, data here does not only contain information about countries. Uh, so I came up with this way to uh, filter out all the observations that come from uh, a group of countries rather than a single country. Um, so I'm just going to run this and this will create a vector 
uh, with unique names of each country that is included in our data set. Um, and I use this here using this kind of funky operator with the percentage signs and the in. What this does is it opens up, you know, our COVID data dates data set over here, and it looks at each line of our data and it looks at Afghanistan and asks, is this value in this vector? And it is, so it keeps it. And then it goes to the next one. And the next one is Africa, which we've seen many times last week. And it asks, okay, Africa total, is it in countries? No, it is not in countries. So it disregards um, all those observations that came from Africa and so on and so forth. Uh, for each of our observations. Um, I then want to select only a few um, variables just to make it a little bit easier for myself to uh, look at my data and work with it. I then do this pivot wider, which I just showed you, uh, but with my whole data set this time, not just the UK data. Um, and then I rename um, these, these columns that I just created for the cases and the deaths. Um, I find cases and deaths a good enough, a, a good ish name, but it's a bit vague. Um, it doesn't specify if it is the number of cases or if it is the rate. And since I would like to work with both of these variables, I rename uh, the cases column to be uh, cases underscore count and same with deaths. And then I create uh, the cases rate um, variable and the deaths rate variable uh, using the formula that we saw last week. And I also use these handy Blueberry date functions um, that let me access just the year or just the month of a date. Um, and I create two columns with this. Um, I, I, like, I like this because it allows me to filter uh, observations by the year and the month uh, with relative ease. Uh, so that is why I created uh, some new columns. Um, and I used the two date rather than the from date because of just preference, um, if you pushed me, I would use the from date. <laughs> okay, so I haven't run this yet. I will run it now. Uh, and that should have created the COVID data clean data set over here with my new um, columns that I wanted. Um, and it is a little bit, um, well, it is quite a bit shorter actually, because um, mostly because of the indicator being split into cases and uh, deaths. So I've made my data set a little bit wider um, than it was long before. Okay. So this is the clean data set with which we will be working uh, today to make our plots. Um, but I would like to show you before, before we go on to DataViz, I would like to show you how to export this data set. At the moment, it only lives in your R environment um, and you might want to you know, um, have it as a CSV or TSV file to use for other things. So uh, the way you do that is, um, using the write function. So we saw the read function, we're now learning the write function. So quite similar, write underscore CSV. Um, and the first thing you want to pass is uh, the name of your uh, data set uh, as it is called in R, so COVID data clean. And the second um, argument that you want to pass is the file name. So um, you do this by specifying the path again. So we created a folder called data underscore clean previously. Um, data underscore clean, which is at the moment empty. So we will finally populate it uh, with uh, this clean data set. And I will call it I'm not very imaginative. I'm going to call it COVID data clean dot CSV. And if I now run this, and I enter my uh, folder here, my data underscore clean folder. You can see that it is now in here. And if you wanted to save this uh, data set as a TSV file instead, um, it is not difficult. You just change the function from write CSV to write TSV. And in the extension, instead of 
it be a CSV file, we call it a TSV file. And if I run this again, you see that um, this has now also been created. So this is how you can export data in these different um, file formats. Okay, so we're now caught up with last week's stuff. Um, was everyone able to, to follow with everything? Could you give me um, a green check? I see one green check. I see two green checks. I see more green checks. Excellent. See a red X. I just um, had a typo in my code, Irini, which I've been trying to find. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, um, the, the code is giving you an error. Could you paste it in the HackMD? And uh, Ellen or uh, Rania can help you find what the typo is. Sure. Awesome. All right. Um, excellent. So now that I think most people um, are mostly caught up, um, and Tim, hopefully, um, Ellen or Rania will be able to help you. Um, Ellen, Rania, if you need them, there are also some breakout rooms that you can uh, go with people if they're like really stuck. Um, so you can catch them up there if you know it's something that can't just be figured out uh, via the chat or something like that. All right, uh, I will now finally start talking about data visualization. So I will go back to my slides. Um, and talk about what uh, we'll learn uh, today. So this looks a bit sparse, uh, but uh, there is a lot of things to talk about today. So um, we'll learn how to create various kinds of plots, uh, including line plots, scatter plots, and bar plots using ggplot2. Uh, we'll only also learn uh, how to do something called faceting uh, in ggplot2. And we'll also see how to you know, build quite complex and customized plots uh, from data in this data frame that we just created, our clean uh, COVID data data frame. Um, so this is just a little bit of like inspiration. These are all um, plots that I created in the process of um, thinking about this workshop today. Um, some of these are probably more useful than others, but these are all things, um, except probably the map, unless we somehow have a lot of time. Uh, these are all things that you should be able to create by the end of this workshop. Um, so most of you, I imagine, will not know what ggplot2 is. Um, ggplot2 is a package, um, which like all the packages we've seen this in this workshop series is included in the tidyverse. Uh, and you can use it to create highly customizable plots. You do this by building them step by step, basically by adding layers, um, which is just like a really powerful way of creating plots, I think. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you do, um, yeah, the, the freedom that you have to combine exactly the elements that you want to create um, a really unique plot that portrays exactly what it is you want to show with your data. Um, I say here that the separation of a plot into layers allows a high degree of flexibility with minimal effort. To an extent that it is true, um, I will also say that it gives you a lot of space uh, for tinkering, which if you like tinkering with plots, you can spend a lot of time tinkering with plots in ggplot, uh, but it is fun. So how does it work? Um, this is the basic code that we will be writing uh, throughout this workshop today. So we will always start with some kind of data set, which we will pipe into the ggplot function. Within the ggplot function, we will specify some aesthetic mappings, which sounds a little bit odd, but I will explain what that is in a couple of slides. After that, um, basically what the aesthetic mappings do is basically tell R how to interpret the data into a graphical element. And then we will tell R um, what kind of shape we want it to draw, you know, if we want it to be a line plot or a bar plot or um, you know, a map. Um, and then we can do as much customization as we want. 
And this is um, an illustration of how ggplot works. Uh, so you can see all these little uh, boxes over here that contain the various layers um, that I'm talking about here as well. So over here we have aesthetics and then we have our geoms. We can add various themes and there's all sorts of packages to help you I know, create animated plots um, and stuff like that. So it is, it is quite a, modular in that sense. And uh, you can create all sorts of plots as you can see um, over there. I also wanted today to talk to you about data visualization in general. So not just how to create plots um, using ggplot, but some good things to keep in mind when making plots in whatever you know um, tool you're using. This is you know really, small things. This is not like a proper data visualization, you know, like um, class. But the first thing I wanted to explain was uh, what aesthetics are. And that can feel quite abstract, but I like this quote from uh, Klaus Wilkie's uh, Fundamentals of Data Visualization, which is that whenever we visualize data, we take data values and we convert them in a systematic and logical way into the visual elements that make up the final graphic. So all data visualizations map data values into quantifiable features of the resulting graphic. And we refer to those features as aesthetics. So I think that is quite a good explanation of what aesthetics are. Uh, it's still quite vague. Um, so to give you some examples to make it a little bit more concrete, um, aesthetics are things like position, you know, like deciding which uh, variable is going to go uh, onto your x-axis and which one is going to go into your y-axis. Um, the use of color to distinguish between different conditions. Um, you can use, you know, different sizes. Um, often uh, in scatter plots, you can have uh, dots of different sizes. Uh, to show how many dots, uh, how many uh, data values uh, there are with that value. Um, you can use shape. Uh, you may have seen again in scatter plots um, that people make distinctions between conditions uh, using you know, squares versus circles or triangles or something like that. And people often also use uh, different line types to show different conditions in line plots. You can have like a you know, uh, a continuous line, or you can have a dotted line um, and stuff like that. These are all types of aesthetics. Um, and you can use any of them or a combination of them. But I just wanted to show you um, a couple of examples, uh, maybe cautionary tales uh, about using uh, various aesthetics. So this is a mock uh, plot that I created uh, where we have 100 observations um, let's say that, you know, 99 of them are in one condition and one of them is in a different condition. We have the red condition and the green condition, okay? And you visualize this in your plot using the aesthetic of color, right? Like color is meaningful here. Um, it distinguishes some data uh, values from other data values. Um, I assume that all of you can see where uh, the green value is, right? It is over here. Um, it is quite a salient difference. All of these are red, only this one is green. So this is the color aesthetic. Here we're using the shape aesthetic. So all of our values are green, but 99 are triangles and one of them is a circle. Um, can you find the green circle, the green dot? Give us a, a green check mark uh, when you do. Yeah, a few, okay, quite a few have found it. Okay, you have sharp eyes. Well done. Um, okay, so you can still find it. It is over here, um, but I would say it's not as salient as this one, right? Like this really pops, this one you have to look for. So I would say that color is a more salient aesthetic than shape. And then you have something like this, where you have four conditions um, and you are showing them along, you know, kind of like two dimensions, one of them of color and one of them being uh, shape. 
So we have a bunch of red triangles and red circles. We have a bunch of green triangles. Uh, can you find the green circle? Okay, yes. I can see a few people have. Nice. So again, it is possible. The green circle is over here. Um, but I think you can appreciate that it is a lot more difficult. Um, so this is just to say, you know, be mindful of which aesthetics you're using, uh, which ones are more salient, and how many aesthetics can you reasonably combine in one plot and still have it make sense for people. You know, you want your findings to pop. You don't want them to, you know, you don't want people to have to dig and dig and dig to be able to see um, the pattern or whatever it is that you're trying to illustrate. So that's about aesthetics. Um, kind of zooming into color. Um, in this previous game that we just played, um, a lot of you were able to distinguish between red and uh, green, but actually um, that is something you generally shouldn't ask people to do because um, the ability to see the difference between red and green um, is the most common, uh, or losing that ability is the most common form of uh, color blindness. Um, so if I'd had any colorblind uh, participants in today's course, and I really hope I didn't. Um, yes. there you go. Yeah. You did. Oh, I did. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Tim. <laughs> no, it's uh, I, it's uh, good to be the topic of the, uh, <laughs> the problem. <clears throat> Well, you'll be pleased to know that at least uh, I was doing it uh, to to make a point, which is don't do what I Indeed, just did. Indeed, I am not offended. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yes, don't do what I just did. Uh, instead, use something like the Viridis uh, color palettes, which are relatively colorblind friendly. Uh, there are different uh, palettes, all uh, conveniently packaged in one well, package. Um, I'll only really show you one today, uh, this uh, Viridis uh, package. Um, and I also think it's a very pretty uh, palette. So, you know, it, it works all around. And of course, Tim can tell us if it actually is colorblind friendly or not. Um, cool. Uh, so that is all I had to say about getting started with DataViz for the time being. Uh, so we can now uh, get our hands dirty a little bit, and um, I'll have a little more to say uh, later. Okay, so um, I am back in my R studio, uh, and I'm going to start uh, creating some plots. Um, one thing that I would like you to do is uh, to go down here in the console and uh, create another uh, folder. So um, I also, I want to have a folder where we can save our, um, our figures that we're going to create today. So we don't have something for figures yet. So I'm just going to type there dot create uh, and in quotation marks, uh, the word figures, and I'm going to run this. Um, and this created my um, folder, which is great. And the other thing I would like you to do in the console is to install the package Viridis Light. So be mindful of the spelling. Um, the first, uh, like the V is a small V and the L is a capital L and it's spelled L-I-T-E. And I will just copy these things and put them in as comments uh, just to keep a track for when I share this uh, afterward. Cool. So please do these two things um, and also load Viridis. Oops. Viridis light. Make sure you actually run this code. 
Um, okay, cool. So we are now ready to get started. So um, just before I do that, a reminder that the kind of code that we'll be using today, the format is we start with a data set, we pipe it into the ggplot function, we define some aesthetics, and then we use the plus sign to add layers in ggplot, not the pipe sign. Um, you'll, you'll get used to this. Uh, I know it's a bit strange, but... Uh, and then we add a geom uh, to tell our what uh, shape we wanted to draw. Um, so this is not real code. This is just like uh, a reminder of um, how we'll be structuring our code. So I'm going to put this in a comment. If you want to comment out multiple lines of code, like I want to do here, you can click on Command, Shift, and C, or Control, Shift, and C uh, on Windows to uh, comment out multiple lines of code. All right. And with that, uh, I'm going to do just that. I'm going to pipe the COVID data clean data set. Um, I'm going to use just the UK data just to get us started so it's not too overwhelming. Um, okay, and then I'm going to pipe it into the ggplot function. Okay. So this is the first step. We put it in the ggplot function, and I will actually just run this already and see what happens. So you can see that over here uh, in this quadrant, uh, our studio has already switched to the plots tab. So um, R already knows that I'm going to be making some figures. Obviously, it hasn't done anything. It's just drawn a gray square for me where I am going to start adding all the various layers that make up my plot. Okay. The next step is to define some aesthetics. So this is where I decide, you know, what relationship I want to show in my plot. Um, and to get us started, I would like to show the, um, the number of cases in the UK um, over time. So uh, because it is time, um, I'm, time usually goes on the x-axis. So I am going to put you know, my time variable in the x-axis. Um, I'm going to use the to date to do this. I could have used the from date. Um, yeah, this is basically where time is encoded in my data. So one of those two should work. Um, and in the y-axis, I am going to plot um, the number of cases um, for each week in my data set. Okay, so now I have some aesthetics. So let's see what happens if I run this. Okay, so I still don't have a plot, um, but you can see that this has done something. So R now knows that in the X, uh, sorry, in the X axis, I'm going to plot my dates. And in the Y axis, I'm going to plot um, the number of cases. And it also knows, you know, like the range of those values. It knows that I have data for three years, 2020, 2021, 2022. And, you know, how, you know, the, the range of how many cases there were in a week in the UK going from zero to over 1 million, which is terrifying. Okay, but that is still not a plot. <laughs> uh, the last thing I want to add is uh, the geometric function, uh, the shape that I want R to draw. Um, and most commonly, this, this kind of relationship is shown with a line plot. So that is what I'm going to draw. All of these are going to start with geom underscore. And you can see that R already helpfully uh, suggests various geoms. These, is, these are all the kinds of plots that you can draw, which is a bit overwhelming. So I will stop scrolling and I will just write geom underscore line. Um, and I will now run this. Why are you complaining? That's not. Okay. I don't know why this is complaining, but this is fine. Okay, I finally have a plot. 
it's not the prettiest plot, but it is a line plot. Um, and it shows how cases um, evolved in the UK um, from the beginning of 2020 until mid 2022. So uh, could I see uh, again in the reactions if you were able to generate a plot? Yes, I see green check marks, three, four, five. Oh. Um, if anyone is struggling, please do ask for help. Uh, if you're not able to generate this plot, do tell um, Rania or Ellen. All right. Um, Um, I saw that uh, someone was asking to place the code. Oh, in the... Or oh, somewhere, I mean, so I'm, I'm behind because I've been trying to sort out typo in the first pivot wider. Oh, so I see. It's just, I mean, the code yeah. makes sense, but... Can you please share more. with us out, uh, the, your error? Sorry. I was I've been helping him sort Yeah, of. thanks, Ellen. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, also the this code um is uh, is already in the HackMD. Ah, okay. So yeah, it should be online. I think it might be helpful to share everything that you've done up until this point as well. So the bit before it from the previous Yes. Yeah, share the whole thing. I would just say. <laughs> um I'll just put it uh, I don't know. I'll put it here. Um, and doo -doo -doo. format it semi nicely. Yeah. So you should now be able to see everything that I have already written starting um, on line 109 in the HackMD if you've gotten lost. Um, one thing to keep in mind is please make sure you've opened the R project because if you haven't, downloading data, saving files and all of that stuff is not going to, to work. It's going to break if you just copy paste it. So just make sure you've opened up um, that project file. All right. Um, I hope that this fixes your typo, Tim. <laughs> um, if, if not, you can still uh, tell me. What I'm going to show now is um, some kind of like tinkering things. Um, all right. So I have created this plot. Um, I may have some grumbles about how it looks. Maybe I don't like the fact that my line is black. Maybe I think it's too thin or too uh, thick. So these are all things that you can um, change. So geomline is also a function and it has a bunch of um, optional arguments. Um, so for example, if you wanted to make this line thicker, you could add the argument size. The default is one. Um, and if you want it thicker, you can do values over one. And if you want it thinner, you can uh, use values under one. So if I want to make it just a little bit thicker, I could say 1.1 and run it. And you see that this has made my line uh, a bit thicker. If I wanted to change its color, um, I could add an argument that is called color. Um, and I think my favorite color name to write in R is tomato, which is a very pleasant red. Um, so I can also add this um, option for color uh, and make my line red, like so. Um, you could also change the kind of uh, line type that you have. So here, you know, we have a continuous line. You could change your line to be um, a dotted line instead like so. Um, so these are all small modifications you can do um, to how your, um, your plot looks. Nothing changes here about, you know, like the actual relationship that you're showing. Uh, it's just, you know, like the 
the visuals of it, like, you know, your personal preferences about what is pretty and what isn't. Um, however, all of those things that I have added here, just to make my plot a little bit prettier or whatever, are also things that I mentioned when I was talking about aesthetics, right? Um, I talked about all of these, size, color, and line type, as something that could potentially um, show, you know, like a, a relationship between um, my data or, you know, visualize uh, a feature of my data. Um, but these currently don't, right? Like the fact that my line plot is red does not really give me any more information about the data that I am displaying. It's maybe saying that I like the color red. Um, yeah. So I could use those things to show these kinds of relationships. And to do that, I would move these from just optional arguments um, in the function that you know draws the shape I want, and I would use them as aesthetics. So I'm just gonna show you how to do that. Um, so I'm gonna do something quite similar. I'm going to start with my COVID data, COVID data claim, sorry. And then I'm going to pipe that into, um, I'm going to pipe that into my filter function again. And this time, I'm not only going to keep my uh, data from the UK, I'm also going to keep some data from another country. Doesn't matter which country, I'm picking the Netherlands. Um, for this. Um, and I am going to use color to show um, a distinction about whether the data comes from the United Kingdom or whether it comes from the Netherlands. So I'm going to pipe all of this into my ggplot function and I'm going to set my aesthetics. So my x is the same, it's the to date, and the y is also the same, it's the case count. But now I'm going to add a third aesthetic, which is color. And that is going to be decided by the country um, from which the observation that I'm plotting comes from. And again, I'm going to add my geom line function to create my line plot. So if I run this now, um, you can see that I now have lines of two colors, um, the blue one being uh, about the United Kingdom and the red one being about the Netherlands. The vertical line shortcut. That is a very good question. On my keyboard, it is shift and a key next to enter or return. Um, but I have a very strange keyboard, so I don't know <laughs> if that's the case for anyone else. Um, if you can't type this, well, I mean, I'll just copy it and I will paste it <laughs> here. You can copy and paste it from the chat. <laughs> I think sometimes it's shift and backslash, and sometimes it's shift and the one of the ones on the top, the one in the top left corner, depending on the keyboard. Yeah, different keyboards do this differently. Um, but I think Richard has managed. Okay, backslash. Cool. All right. Um, so yeah, that is how you can use color as an uh, aesthetic mapping. And you can do this with as many countries as you want. So if you wanted to um, also add data for, say, Germany, um, you could just run the same code again. And it now adds uh, Germany as well. And this creates the, you know, the color 
um, difference that uh, we try to avoid, which is red versus green. Uh, it is really um, annoying that the default palette that R uses uh, is one that is not colorblind friendly, but I can now show you how to use the Viridis palette. Um, and it is fairly straightforward. Um, the only thing you do is add uh, one more um, function, and that is scale color Viridis. And see uh, that R uh, gives you three options, um, you know, one ending in B, one ending in C, one ending in D. I think this stands for binomial think that, or binary, I think this, these are the only two that I use. So this is for continuous variables and this is for discrete variables. And what we have here is a discrete variable. So I'm going to use this function over here. So scale underscore color underscore viridis underscore D, open and close parentheses. And if I now run this, we'll see that the colors have changed. And if the yellow is a little bit difficult to see, you can maybe make your lines a little bit thicker um, or something like that. If that, oops, <laughs> put that in the wrong place. That should specify the size of the genome line, not the size of the palette, which doesn't make any sense. So something like this. It's not a great plot, but um, you know, it, it sort of works. Um, did that work for people? I see some green checks. Tim, were you able to fix your typo or whatever error uh, you had? Yes, thank you, yeah. Ah, excellent, okay. Um, I don't see any Xs, so uh, I will now move us on to do an exercise. So I would like you to filter the COVID data, clean data set that we've been working on. Um, and filter it such that it only contains observations from Denmark and Sweden, only for the year 2020. And then create a line plot uh, of the cases rate uh, by the two date, which we've been using for our plot just now as well, and show the two countries in different colors. So you have five minutes to do this. I thought it'd be interesting to look at Denmark and Sweden because at least early in the pandemic, um, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, like the very different measures that those two countries were taking. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to visualize uh, the cases that they had in 2020. And we're using the rate instead of the count um, to normalize for their differences in population. I'll stop talking now. Uh, once you're done with this exercise, um, give us a green tick or a red X if you're struggling with it.
Okay, it is almost time. I can see two green check marks. Um, I now see three. Um, do the rest, um, have the rest not been able to do this exercise or have you just forgotten to add the reaction? Both are fine. Okay, I can see four green ticks. And No one has put up a red X, so I assume that no one is stuck. But if someone is stuck, do let us know. Um, so this is uh, the solution that I used. Um, so, and I will just copy paste it and do this in R. So like before, I start with the COVID data clean data set. Um, I filter for the two countries that I want, which are Denmark and Sweden. And I also add one more argument uh, to filter for observations that only came for the year 2020. And then I do um, something really similar to before, uh, such that uh, my X, uh, in my X coordinate, I plan the two date my y axis, I plan the cases, I plot the cases rate, um, and I create different uh, colored lines based on which country the observation came from. Um, so I'll just run this, and it gives me this plot. Um, I used the Viridis uh, palette, uh, but you can use uh, the default palette, that is totally fine. And we can see that indeed uh, in 2020, Sweden, uh, which had a lot laxer uh, policy measures around COVID-19, did have um, quite a lot more cases, uh, especially in uh, the winter months. Um, is anyone struggling with this? Not okay, excellent. Um, I will exercise. Me. So I will now move on to talk about um, scatter plots. So these are very common uh, kinds of plots uh, that you see all the time in scientific um, papers. So let's see how to make one. Uh, and I'm going to show quite a basic relationship for this. Um, so let's start again with COVID data clean. And what I am going to show here is the relationship between um, positive cases and deaths. Um, which we would expect to be a linear positive relationship. You know, as cases go up, deaths also go up. So in my X cases, in my X um, axis, I'm going to put the cases. And in my Y axis, I'm going to put um, deaths. And I'm going to create a Give that a shot. Oh, yes, I did forget to add parentheses. This is a very helpful error message. Um, yeah, so this is this is a this is a scatter plot. I don't think this is what I got last time. Interesting. Why do you look different? Hmm. 
this is kind of odd. This seems to be a negative death rate. And that's very strange. Sorry. Uh huh. I do have a negative death rate. Okay. I also have a negative death count. Um. Okay, I'm not sure why that is happening, uh, but it's not really relevant to the visualization <laughs> side of things, though uh, visualization obviously is very helpful for helping you clean your data. So I will just filter this for death's rate being uh, positive um, and try this again. So, yeah, and you can see uh, this is a little strange looking. This is scientific notation. Uh, R does this with like very large or very big uh, or very small numbers. If you want to get rid of it, um, there is this function called, uh, I don't really know what the argument means and what it does, but normally if you run this, yeah, it gets rid of the scientific notation. So uh, to each their own, I prefer, uh, you know, these numbers to the scientific notation. I find it easier to understand. Okay, so this is the basic uh, way to create um, scatter plot in R. Um, I think this looks a little bit strange. I am not sure why. Um, oh, because I used the deaths rate instead of the deaths count. Okay, yes, okay, that looks more like what uh, I've, <laughs> I've seen when I was practicing this. Okay, cool. So unsurprisingly, we can see that as the number of cases goes up, um, the number of deaths uh, also goes up. Obviously, it's quite hard to see what is going on over here uh, because there are just so many uh, observations here. Um, these are all the data in my data set. So I have data for all the countries and for, you know, all three years. Um, so you can experiment a little bit with, um, you know, making the points a little bit smaller. Um, so like we did with the line, you can specify the size to be, I don't know, like half what it is at the moment. And then you can see perhaps a little bit more what's going on. You can also experiment with um, opacity. Um, so the alpha is the thing that uh, you change to add transparency to your data. So the default is one, which is zero transparency. So you can't see behind the dots. Um, but if you put it to under one, then you make your points a little bit transparent. So if I set this to be 0 0.6, say. Um, it's a bit hard to see, um, but if I make this, um, no, I'm not gonna do that, that's annoying. Um, you can perhaps see that like these over here are a different color to these ones over here, because these are not overplotted, like there's only one value here. Here, there are multiple values all on top of each other, which add up to make this solid black, whereas these ones are a bit um, transparent. Um, cool. So something that you would often want uh, to overlay on your um, scatter plot is probably a line that describes the relationship between your uh, x values and your y values. So in R, you could do this using um, another geom. So now what I'm doing is I'm using two geoms, one on top of each other. So uh, I'm going to add a geom smooth. And if I run this, um, it adds a line that tries to describe the relationship between my X and my Y. Um, and yeah, this is really when the kind of 
iterative, you know, um, nature of ggplot where you build your plots by putting one layer on top of the other really comes to shine. So you can, you know, do things like this where you combine basically two plots, um, which I think is really, really neat. And when I say that, you know, there are layers on top of each other, um, that is exactly what I mean. Um, so if I take this and put it before the geom point, um, well, I think you can imagine what is going to happen, um, but I'm also going to run it. And you can see that now um, I draw the line first, the smooth line first, and then I draw the scatter plot. So you can't see the beginning of this line here, right? It is, um, it is obscured by the data points that are on top of it. So the order in which these things are specified in your plot matters. Whichever you put first is drawn first, and the second thing is drawn on top of it. So if you compare this to this, you can see that here the line is visible and here it is not. Um, okay, I'm going to put them in the other order again because I think that makes more sense. Okay, so this is a little bit, <laughs> not a little bit, this is a very difficult to look at plot. Um, because of just the sheer number of observations that are in it. Um, and I think one thing that would be helpful um, is to separate this plot by years, right? The relationship of positive cases and deaths um, must have been really, really close um, before um, vaccines were widely available. But we know that once vaccines were rolled out, um, the relationship between uh, positive cases and deaths started to be a little bit weaker. So um, how would you suggest, uh, please write in the chat, how would you recommend um, we look at uh, differences by year in this plot? Richard, we could uh, we could indeed filter, um, but then we could we would have to make three separate plots, uh, one for each year. So we would filter for the year 2020 and make a plot, and then filter for the year 2021 and make a plot, and then filter for the year 2022 perhaps and make a plot. So that's one way to do it. Yeah, we could make panels of plots. Um, so that is exactly what I'm going to show you how to do now. So in R, you can yeah make panels, you can facet, is how we call it in ggplot, your data using a command called, um, the one that I like is facet wrap. So you write this function, you open and close parentheses, and you have to tell it which variable you want to use to create this uh, paneling or faceting. Uh, and in my case, I want to use uh, the year. I could also have done it by country, for example. But in my case, I want to use the year. So I'm going to use this tilde, um, which is another weird symbol. For me, this is what's next to shift. This is the one that's on the backslash. I think for you, it might now be the one that's next to return. Uh, or enter. Okay, so I add this tilde and then I say which uh, variable I want to use to create the facet. And now if I run this, um, you can see that it has created one panel for each year, 2020, 21, 22. And indeed we can see that in 2022, um, this line is not nearly as steep as it was for 2020 uh, and even for 2021. So indeed, more positive, like positive cases did not lead to deaths as 
you know, necessarily in 2022 as in the previous years. Does that make sense? Let us know if it doesn't. I think that worked for people. Okay, uh, something I wanted to mention about this plot is that um, I set the aesthetics over here, these kind of like global aesthetics that apply to everything that I make in my plot. Um, they are the aesthetics that I have set here in the ggplot function. I can actually also set aesthetics in my uh, individual geoms. So I can have an aesthetic that only applies to my geom point or my geom smooth. Um, so everything that I put in the aesthetic function for ggplot is inherited by anything that is underneath it. But if I set something locally, just for my geom point, uh, an aesthetic, uh, that aesthetic is only going to affect my geom point and not my geom smooth. So this is again where um, the flexibility of ggplot really shines. You can even use different data sets uh, within one plot. So you could make your geom point um, plot you know, from one data set and your geom smooth from a different data set. Obviously, you know, that won't make sense for some cases, right? <laughs> you don't you don't want to mislead people. <laughs> don't don't do this for nefarious reasons. But if you had to like say calculate like some kind of summary or a prediction model or something in one data set and you have some raw data in a different data set, you can combine those in one plot, even though they come from different data sets by setting your aesthetics locally. Um, that is a little bit too complicated. I don't think I'm going to do this today unless I have time. Uh, but it's just something for you to know that ggplot really gives you a lot of flexibility to play around with um, the plots you want to create. Um, the other kind of plot I wanted to show you how to make today is a bar plot. Um, bar plots are everywhere in scientific papers. Um, so. I do want to show you how to make them, but I will add a caveat <laughs> after I show you how to make them. Okay, so bar plots. Um, for this, uh, what I would like to do is, um, so I don't know if you remember when uh, everyone was arguing about whether COVID is worse in winter than it is in summer. Um, so I thought a nice way to look at that um, would be to get a collection of countries from all over the world in the southern, uh, northern hemisphere for the same uh, month, which would be, you know, one season in one hemisphere and a different season um, in the other hemisphere, um, and look at how their uh, cases rates um, differed. So, um, and I'm going to make a bar plot of that. So the first thing I want is just a vector of uh, countries. I don't want to do it with all the countries that we have because that's going to be an unreadable plot. Um, so can people um, just give me some countries? Just put some in the chat. Um, I'd like them to cover the whole globe. Um, I see Argentina. I'm going to add the United Kingdom because that's where we are. Greece. <laughs> I'm going to add South. Korea, let's see, Canada, Australia, um, I'll add two, two, two. Mexico, 
we have two, four, six. I'd like to have about 10, I think. Um, what are we missing? Let's add South Africa and see Russia, two, four, six, eight, nine, and I'll add, I'll add Kenya. Okay, cool. We have a few countries, so I'll just make my vector. And I will uh, privilege data plan clean uh, filter for uh, the country in uh, those countries in countries selection. Um, I will filter for only one year. Uh, I'll stick with 2021. And I will select only, oh, oops, year. Um, and I will only keep one month as well. I'll go for July. So that should be, um, hmm. we don't have very many in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> um, oh, well, it's fine. We have a couple. Um, yeah, so in the Southern Hemisphere, that should be winter, and in the Northern Hemisphere, um, it should be summer. And then I will make my uh, plot, whoops, pipe it, GG plot. Okay, and let's add some aesthetics. Um, cool. So we want, So we want to have uh, the country and uh, the cases uh, rate. So I am going to put the country in my X axis and I'm going to put the cases rate in the Y axis. And uh, I'm then going to add all of this to a geom call. Um, and I'm going to run it. Yes, that is what I meant. Cool. Um, so we can see um, that this has created um, a bar plot where it tells me uh, what the case rate is uh, for various, uh, for the countries that we selected uh, in July of 2021. So one thing that I would like to point out is that the cases rate is calculated by week. And the time period that we have selected here is a month. So we've kind of given data that is a little bit confusing to plot. Um, what R has done here is it's basically taken the values for each week in July for each of these countries, and it has added them together. And that is what it is showing us here. Um, that is okay if you know that that is what R is, is going to do. Um, but if you don't know what R is going to do, it is generally better to specify explicitly uh, what you want to show. So a way to do that here would have been to um, create um, that new variable that we are plotting. So basically calculate uh, a rate for cases uh, for the whole month. Um, so you could do that by grouping by country and then creating a new column with mutate called um, cases rate month, which is um, the sum of the cases count divided by population and multiplied by a hundred thousand. 
So that is just to make it a little bit more explicit what it is that we are um, plotting. So if I do this again, uh, we get exactly the same. <laughs> okay, uh, this is not doing what I thought it would do. Um, why is it not doing what I thought it would do? Hmm. Oh, okay, I used the wrong command. Uh, let's see what this does. Um, okay, so I want to ungroup. I'm sorry, I will explain this in a moment. Um, okay, what are you doing here? Oh. Ugh. Okay. You know what? Uh, let's ignore this. Uh, I don't know why this is happening right now. Um, but let's go with the implicit way that works and gives us the right thing, um, which was cases. Wait. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I um, I think it's a bit too late in the day for me to debug my own code at the moment. No worries, Irene. You can <laughs> actually use the order command. The which one? Reorder. Uh, if you like to have an order or descending or accepting order, yes. It's, yeah. if it's not, no, no worries, no worries. That's not what I'm trying to do at the okay, moment. Okay, okay. Um, but yeah, no, we'll do that in a moment. No, uh, so anyway. So, oh, Jesus, sorry, this is very confusing, but yeah, this, okay, fine. Um, pretend the last five minutes didn't happen. We now have our bar plot. It shows um, the, it shows the number of cases, of positive cases for COVID-19 in these countries per 100,000 in the population. Uh, ideally, I would have liked to uh, calculate um, the case rate for each month, but for whatever reason, my code is not working at the moment, I will fix it and um, post it after the lesson, uh, but it's not really important for the data visualization part. Um, what I actually want to show for visualization here is I want to show you uh, how to make this a little bit easier to read. So there are various things that are making this a little bit hard to look at. One of them is that we can't really read the names of all of the countries. They're all like bunched up together. So one thing that you will often see people suggest when that is the case is to um, kind of like rotate 
these um, labels to make them not fall on top of each other. I don't like that solution very much. So especially when working with um, bar plots, what I usually do is I just flip the coordinates um, and you'll see what I mean in a moment. Um, so I add this function that basically just creates um, this kind of plot where instead of vertical, my bars are horizontal. I find this a lot easier to read, right? Like all of the names of the countries are very nice um, and legible, which is great. And the other problem is exactly what uh, Rania mentioned, which is that these are not in order. So, okay, I can tell that the United Kingdom definitely has the highest um, case, case rate, uh, but some of the other ones are a little bit difficult uh, to judge. So for example, Russia and Greece, I mean, I have the grid uh, here, which shows me that Greece did have a higher um, caseload than Russia did, but uh, I have to look for it a little bit more. It's not just immediately obvious. And a way to make that immediately obvious would be to sort um, these uh, values, uh, th to sort these bars based on um, how big they are, basically. Um, so you may remember this um, arrange um, function that we learned about um, last week, uh, which basically uh, sorts our, which sorts um, our observations in a certain order, either of ascending or ascending, descending order. Uh, but if I do this now, um, it doesn't really do anything. Um, that is because um, R plots our data using um, the country information. And country is a character um, data type. And R only knows how to you know, sort that alphabetically. So here, because I flip things, it's in reverse alphabetical order. Um, so there isn't very much I can do with that at the moment. However, we learned a couple of workshops ago about using factors, the levels of which uh, we can reorder. So that is what we're going to do now. We are going to treat our country um, uh, variable as a factor and we're going to change its levels. So this is a command from the um, forecasts package that kind of enhances what we can do with factors in R. And we're going to use the reorder um, variable, which as it says here, lets us reorder the levels of one factor by sorting along the values of another variable, which is exactly what we want to do here. We want to sort our country, um, you know, values based on the cases rate that they have. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to use the mutate function and we're going to say that the country is now going to be reordered um, and what we're going to reorder is the levels of country based um, the cases, right. So now I have this thing that I wanted that my um, bars are nicely ordered in descending order based on how many cases they had um, in month of 2020, in July of 2021. Okay, so that took, <laughs> a bit longer than I wanted it to. Um, but hopefully that makes some kind of sense. Um, and yeah, let's let's do an exercise and see if um, if you can try and recreate uh, this type of thing. 
So what I would like you to do now uh, is to create uh, this kind of like flipped bar chart, like I just showed you, um, that shows the total death count for 2020 for these countries that we selected. And I would like you to order them from the highest death toll to the lowest. I will copy and paste um, all of the code that I have written into the hack and D. So, oh. Uh, so that you can, um, you know, see all the countries and stuff like that um, in case you weren't able to follow along with everything. So that is one thing. Uh, if you want to challenge yourself a little bit fast, uh, a little bit more, you can also do this um, faceting for the years 2020, 2021, and 2022. Uh, I will start the timer and I will copy all of my code and put it in the hacking D here. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. 
We are about halfway through the time for the exercise. Um, how are people going with that? Because we don't have very much time left today and I would like to show you two more things before we close. Uh, I see one green check mark, two green check marks. Three. Okay, four. Excellent. All right. In that case, um, I know I just spent too long trying to show you how to make bar charts, uh, but I will now uh, tell you that bar charts are often not a good plot to make. Um, and the reason for that is that they do away with a lot of the complexity in data. So what I'm showing here uh, is, as you can see, there are five panels. In the first panel, we see uh, a bar plot, right, with uh, two conditions. Uh, and we also see that they have error bars. Um, and these four um, um, facets or uh, bits over here, sorry, um, show uh, four different cases for the distributions or for the raw data um, that were used to create these bar charts. So, you know, one of these is true. We don't know which one. So the best case scenario, what we always hope when we see a bar chart is something like this, that we have uh, equal numbers of observations in, my, in our data that, uh, you know, uh, create the two conditions, and that um, they are more or less of a similar distribution. And this has a high, a slightly lower mean, and this has a high, a slightly higher mean. Um, another possibility, which we would like to avoid when making a bar chart, is that the raw data for the two bar charts um, are actually quite similar, but one of them has a an outlier uh, has one single value um, that is very different to the rest, and that skews uh, the mean of one of our conditions to be a lot higher than the other one. So that's not great. Um, something else that could happen is that you could have a bimodal distribution such that, um, you know, most of your values uh, are either in one low end or one high end. Um, and what you're doing is you're getting something in the middle, which does not really reflect your values well at all, because they're, you know, uh, either on one side or the other side. Uh, so that's also not great if you're showing it um, as a bar chart. And another thing that could happen is that you could have um, unequal values between your conditions. And that's quite hard to see uh, when you uh, do away with all of that complexity and just show a bar chart. So these are some of the things that could be happening that could make um, a bar chart not a good um, visualization for data. Um, and something that has been gaining traction in the last few years is using something like a rain cloud plot. And this is a plot created by Cedric Terror. I follow him on Twitter for a long time. I don't actually know how his name is pronounced, but he does amazing visualizations using ggplot and infographics. And I have linked um, his website um, if you want to get some inspiration. It's also in the Hack and D. And this image comes from a tutorial that he has on creating rain cloud plots. Okay, so what are rain cloud plots? Rain cloud plots um, consist of at least two elements. One of them is this kind of like density, um, which illustrates the distribution from which the data came. So it shows you the shape of the distribution. And there's also a visualization of the actual raw data. So those things are always there. Uh, and you'll often see something like a box plot to show measures of like central tendency um, and stuff like that. So this is a much richer visualization of uh, the data that you have. And it just provides a lot more information to people compared to something like this. 
Um, it is, of course, a lot more complicated and a bit more difficult um, to interpret if you're not used to them. So, um, you know, uh, things to to kind of try to counterbalance there. Um, but I just wanted to mention that there are some issues with using bar plots, especially not if you're portraying something like, you know, a count or a percentage, um, but if you're showing like an average uh, that contains information about like um, multiple numbers that you have somehow summarized, that could be um, a bit of an issue. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to show. And the last thing that I wanted to show uh, back in our studio is how to save your plots. Um, so the first thing that you need to do is you need to save your plot into an object. So I'm going to name this into bar plot and I'm going to run this. So you can see that this now appears as an object in my environment. And now I'm going to use the command gg save and I'm going to, um, let me just open up the help uh, because I don't remember the order of the arguments, gg save. So you want uh, a file name which is uh, the combination of the path and the name of the file. So we're saving this in our new um, folder that we made called figures. Uh, and we're going to call it barplot.png. And then we want to specify which plot we are saving, which is this thing, which is why we need to save this uh, in an object, uh, bar plot. Um, the defaults, the default dimensions for saving our plots is 775 inches by 635 inches. Um, you can change those and save your plots in whatever dimensions you like. But if we now go to my figures, um, we can see that I have indeed saved my uh, plot. And if I click on it, I can look at it in all of its glory. Um, so yes, um, didn't have time for this. Um, I also wanted to say that, you know, this is just the beginning. There are so many things that you can do in ggplot and there's a whole universe of packages that work um, with ggplot um, that allow you to make you know, really, really uh, fancy plots, um, you know, both visually uh, with like palettes and themes and fonts, um, but also you can like actually animate your plots um, and stuff like that. Um, I didn't have time to show you how to um, tinker with your plot, um, but I will add some code on how to do that in the demo script once I upload it on GitHub. Um, and please do come to the office hours uh, if you would like to practice more or if you got lost a little bit today. I know it was a bit rushed toward the end. Um, please do come uh, for those office hours and I can help you with everything that uh, you have questions about. So I will now stop the recording.